my God. So over the last couple of weeks, it's been the words that were similar, that were brought from the Bible, but in different scriptures, I think. The first one was Numbers 9.23, the first week was the main scripture. And last week, I brought it out of um, Exodus 3.8, where God says in Exodus 3.8 that he will come down and he will deliver his people out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up to a land that is good, flowing with milk and honey. God said that last week and then a bit, bit of the week before was about God's the exact same thing. It's God's going to deliver his people. He, um, he's come down to deliver them. The people were wandering around in wilderness and they were not even, they, they would pass through the, um, through the wilderness and they were wind, winding and whining to about Moses and Aaron and Caleb and uh, Joshua who were uh, two uh, disciples because a disciple is a follower of somebody. So they were two disciples of Moses and Aaron and they submitted to their leaders and they rebuked the tribe, the whole house of Israel when they grumbled and grinded against uh, Moses and Aaron, they, they, they're the kind of people you want to hang around in church, you want to hang around those that submit, not those that are scattered all over the place, is more or less what I'm saying. And they said these, the house of Israel then had been through the wilderness and they had never, ever, ever been in slavery because they weren't in, back in the wilderness, all the people that were enslaved died off, so these people are free. And they're saying to Moses and Aaron, why don't you just take us back to e Egypt so we can be slaves again. We'll, we'll be looked after better back then. But they've never had the mentality of the slave. And then that's when we go through and they, and they approach Jesus and say, what do you mean in, in like, uh, John 8? What do you mean in whom the son sets free shall be free indeed? We are children of Abraham and we've never been in slavery before. And Jesus says, well, if you're enslaved to sin, if, if, if you sin, you are enslaved to sin. When Jesus said that, so Jesus is taking it around back to what they were doing, complaining against Moses and, and um, Aaron, where they were in rebellion and they were in uh, rejection, disobedience, grumbling against their leaders, which then enslaved them to sin. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying in, in the New Testament, that even though they hadn't been enslaved, they were still under Abraham, he's our father, he's our leader. We've never been in slavery before. Jesus said, well, if you sin, you're enslaved to sin. So that was a little bit over the last couple of weeks. And then we know that these people crossed through to the Promised Land and some of them, like even Moses, died off and didn't actually enter in to the Promised Land. And Joshua was the one that led them across the Jordan yeah. to the Promised Land. And they didn't have what we have today. We have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit coming and li living and dwelling inside of us, continually giving without measure. And if you have a look at Joseph, who Joseph even doubted that Mary was in child, in, in, had a child in her womb by the Holy Spirit at the beginning and he had an angel come and visit him. Then he had another angel visit him in a dream and he was told, Joseph, in a dream at night, get the baby and take the baby into Egypt. And immediately, Joseph woke up he didn't wait till morning. He didn't wait to pack everything up and do his household and everything like that. He got Mary and, and the baby, Jesus, and he took them into Egypt immediately without what we have today. We have, we have an infilling of the Holy Spirit that's given without measure. We have something that can make us live in obedience way more than the people back in the Old Testament or even the fishermen when they were called or the disciples because Jesus still hadn't 
death, burial, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus hadn't happened, so the Holy Spirit wasn't given, Pentecost 1, Acts 1, 4 to 8, hadn't happened, so there was no great tongues of fire or like a mighty rushing wind being out of the living side of them, but they had obedience that we should have today, but we don't have that obedience. And that disobedience stopped people from entering into promised land. And even, these are just some of the things that I've been throwing in over the last couple of weeks. Even when Adam fell, God walked in the garden and God said, Adam, where are you? And in obedience, he still had obedience to God the word of God, he went back and said, we're over here, we knew we were naked, so we hid ourselves. So he, even though he, 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 he fell in disobedience, he was still close enough to God to be able to answer straight away and be obedient to what God had said, and even confess to God what he'd done. Where we are a bit <coughs> slow at that these days, because I don't know why. I don't know why, but we are, and we need to be honest, because there were people that were in the wilderness that never crossed over into the promised land. And if we aren't going to get real with God, will we cross over into the promised land? There's no, there's no good by bowing down before God and saying, well, here, you can say it here, it's rubbish what Pastor Matt says. But if it's real, at the end of time, what can I do? I'm told that the Holy Spirit through me has said this. So I can't say, well, God, they, well, I, you know, I might have looked a bit ridiculous to them, God. Just bring them in anyway. No, I spoke through you. I gave them a word. They should have been obedient because the people in the Old Testament were more obedient than what they are without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I don't know. And I did throw that in, in uh, John Owen's Jesus' seat. Apart from me, for I did not know you. So there is people that are in the church, in the congregation, that prophesied in his name, prayed and healed and cast out demons in his name, and he still said, depart from me, for I do not know you. Okay? So today, in uh, Isaiah, still, still along the same kind of lines, but today, it's, it's a... Um, to give us more courage today, to encourage us and lift us up and help us out today for the rest of our Christian walk. So in Isaiah 41, verse 16, you shall, you shall winnow them, the wind shall carry them away. I should have read the one before, but I didn't. And the whirlwind shall scatter them you, sh you shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Father, let's pray for revelation today, Almighty God. We need revelation of your word, Father. Without revelation, Lord, your word is just, just a word, Father. But with revelation, Almighty God, it becomes alive. Father, we need it to be alive inside of us, Almighty God. We need this word to just, just speak to us and minister to us, Almighty God, and give us revelation of what you're saying Amen. to us, Father, so that it can be a living word inside of us, Almighty God. We praise you and honour you. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So you shall winnow them, the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord 
and glory in the Holy One of Israel. So just that. You shall rejoice in the Lord. What are we rejoicing in? Are we rejoicing in everything by God or are we rejoicing, rejoicing in God and everything else? I just like to choose to rejoice in God. We know that he does many, 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 many miracles in our life. Many, 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 not many, 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 many miracles. He does, but many, 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 we only ever give him glory for. We only ever thank him for. We only praise him for. We only give thanks for. But he does way beyond what we can imagine. So he is worth rejoicing over. Don't forget we're at the place now because we haven't crossed over into the promised land yet. So we are at the place of the wilderness. We're in this place that, you know, sometimes it's dry, sometimes it's I'm not hearing from you, God, sometimes I'm doing my own stuff, sometimes I'm hearing from God abundantly. A lot of prophecy words of prophecy here this morning. Sometimes there's none. You know, like, we're at that place, we're, we're at this place. It's not the 400 <coughs> years that would be the 400 years between the book of uh, the Old Testament and Malachi and um, Matthew. In there, there's 400 years silent years. And, um, and remember before then when I, I preached that word that um, I think it was uh, Nehemiah, I think it was, he, or uh, Zechariah, it might have been Zechariah, the prophet, he, he, his last prophecies that were leading into the 400 silent years, that was all that the people had to hold on to. And that was his prophecies were that God was coming back. He's coming back to save his people. He's coming back to call his people out. And for 400 years, that's all the children of Israel or the house of Israel had to hold on to, but they didn't hold on to that because they chose to make for themselves other gods during that years. And now where the, the, the book of Matthew come along and we come into those years where Jesus came and the word of God came to man and started speaking and prophesying and speaking to man again. You shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. Do you glory in God? Do we rejoice in God and do we glory in Him? John 1, 14 says, The only begotten glory of the Father. How do we glory in God? We build a relationship with His Word. We dig into His Word. We read His Word continually, continually. It's not, it's not a balance. It's, it's just it's all of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's all the Word. It's all the Holy Spirit. It's all of God. And I want to show you in a minute... That that's what's in the wilderness. That's what's here with us now. To 100% give us 100% assurity that there is no excuse when you die. Because you can say how dry it is and how hard things are getting. They are here in the wilderness with us right now. The Trinity. The poor and needy seek water. But there is none. So is there any poor and needy here? I hope not. Because we're rich in spirit. We aren't needy. We have abundance. God is our Father. We rejoice in glory in God. Why? Because we're not poor. We have abundance. We're not needy. We're not after nothing. <coughs> and if we want something, do we really need it? The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. So he's talking about poor and needy people, that he's going to listen to them and he won't forsake them. Listen to this now. I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water. What's in the wilderness? What's God said? I will make the wilderness... We can go around and say, oh God, I'm in this wilderness experience. Nothing's happened. It's dry. I can't hear from God. I don't feel his presence. I don't feel him around. I can't hear from the word of God. Well, you need to build a relationship with him. Because there's a pool of water in the wilderness. I just read it. There's a pool of water. What's God say the water is? It's an emblem of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. 
here is there not just a puddle, not just a trickle, but a pool of water that's without measure, abundantly given to us. The Holy Spirit's there in the wilderness. And the dry land springs, springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree. So the wilderness we've got there, it's established. What did Jesus do? God came down here. He walked on the earth. Adam, where are you? Here I am, God, because I'm not completely fell away from you, even though I'm not the same relationship. But I still hear you and I still obedient to you when you call to me. See, this is, this is the thing. When we're ignorant to God, we, we just turned out and switched off from him. Even Adam, in the midst of his having this great relationship, still called out to God and was still answering him when the word spoke to him. Okay? So in this wilderness we've got a pool. Oh, that's right. God came down here and he walked on the earth. Okay? God came down here in the form of Jesus Christ. He walked the earth, his death, burial, and resurrection. Then the ascension on high. God sent what? With great tongues of fire and a mighty gushing wind. He sent a pool in the wilderness. He sent the Holy Spirit, which is a pool in this wilderness, this last stage that we've got before we cross over into the promised land. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got the pool in the wilderness here with us now. Not without measure. It, there's no measure to it. it the whole, John 3.34 The Spirit is given without measure. There's no measure to that. Big pool. Just here. That's here with us. In the wilderness. It's our last day before we cross over into the promised land. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree. Okay? We know what the cedar is, don't we? Huh? The cedar tree is the king of trees. It's known as the, the, the majesty on high of trees. It's the king of trees. Who's the king of kings? Who's the lord of lords? The blind man, Jesus, rubs some mud in his... No, he, he, he touched his eyes, he anointed his eyes, and he said, what do you see? And he opened his eyes up and he said, I see men walking like trees. So God's referring to us a little bit like trees. <coughs> so in the midst of the, the, the wilderness, we have the Holy Spirit, and now we have the cedar tree. What did he snap off? The utmost branch of the cedar tree. Jesus is the cedar tree. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the God of gods. The cedar tree is the king of master of all trees. There's no tree, they reckon, that compares to it. So there's no man that compares to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the cedar tree in the midst of the wilderness. We have a pool of water, which we can see is the Holy Spirit. We know it's the water, it's the Holy Spirit. You've only got to look through Scripture and God will say everywhere where water and Scripture are the same, or wind, like a mighty, or fire is another one. So in the midst of this dry, barren place that we've made up that we're in, because the wilderness doesn't sound like a dry, barren place, it's a place that, boy, I believe it's a place that prepares me as I go through, that prepares me to cross over into the promised land and to, pray, to prepare me. I need a pool of water there. I need the Holy Spirit because if I don't have the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that from the inside that's going to show me that I'm doing wrong. The Holy Spirit's in the, it's there. Whether we tap into it or not, is our, it's, it's up to us. When we bow down before God, we can't say, well, you never give him to me. Oh, yeah, I did. I had him right there. I had him in a pool in the wilderness. I had him in a place where you just had to cry out to him. You had to receive him. You had to build a relationship with him. Hey? So that he could what? So that he could correct, could correct me and, and show me from the inside what I'm doing wrong, where I'm going wrong, how to do it right. And if that's 
not enough. He's put the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords yes. right there. Right next thing he put there, never know Jesus come before, but in Genesis 1 2, the Spirit of God hovered upon us, and then God said. So the Holy Spirit was prior in creation. God, in the beginning, was God, and God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. We're in two now, Genesis 1 2. The earth was without form, and the Spirit of God hovered upon us. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Father, Spirit, Word, or Jesus. So here we've got the Holy Spirit in the wilderness, and then we've got Jesus. If we've got a conviction from the inside of our sin, we've got to repent. We can't hold on to it. It's like you don't change from the outside in. You change from the inside out. So you need the inside conviction. And then what happens? <coughs> Jesus is there, back set it in communion. His blood is there for the forgiveness of our sins. Whatever God shows us, Father, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Man, the blood of Jesus washes it away. So he's there in the wilderness, in this place where God's bearing us down to cross over where we will be there with no excuse. And if Jesus says, depart from me for I do not know you, it's because we haven't worried about being real with our relationship with the pool in the wilderness or with the cedar tree in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit in the wilderness or Jesus in the wilderness. Okay. I'll read the scripture. John 4, verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, are to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. <coughs> Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in, in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. What is in, what is in the wilderness? cedar tree. Jesus. He has water to give to us that we will never thirst again and when we drink that water that he gives to us we will drink that on to everlasting life. And he'll say, come up here my dear children. I love you. I'm glad you're the one I die for. Hey? Instead of depart from me for I do not know you. But Jesus preached every Sunday. I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I actually put hands on the sick and they got better in your name. And now you say, depart from me for I do not know you. And he's just thinking, he said, I had the pool, I had the cedar tree and you were ignorant to drink from the water that gives everlasting life. You wanted to do it your way and not his way. Hey? We can't uh, do it two ways. We can only do it one way, and it's got to be his way. There's no other way. No other way. Okay. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree. Let me see what I've got for the acacia tree. Uh, the acacia tree, the wood of the acacia tree symbolizes this is the this is the, the spiritual con concept con what do you call it me it symbolizes the humanity 
of Christ in the in, in the acacia tree grows <coughs> out in a, in a in a arid desert place. It symbolises the human of the humanity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, the humbleness of Jesus. We're in this wilderness. There's a thing that God has placed there for us to be able to see not only the pool of water, not only the cedar tree, but he's placed the acacia tree there for us to see the humility that Christ walked in. So we can look at the life that Jesus walked in and form our life into that image. Amazing. This is what we are walking around if we... You might be in the promised land, but what are you doing sitting right here? You, somehow you've missed it. I don't know. You can't be in two places at once. You're sitting here because you're going through a wilderness experience to enter into that place, and you've got to have the humanity of Christ. We've got to walk in his humility. We've got to walk in the person that he was. We can only do it by the Holy Spirit and by the forgiveness that he gives. We can walk in his life. He's amazing. The myrtle and the oil tree. I look at the. I know the oil tree, sorry, but I look at the myrtle. The myrtle is not mentioned in the Bible until the time of captivity. Okay? The myrtle tree is not mentioned in the in, in the Bible until the time that Israel went into captivity. Okay? That's saying to me that God has placed in the wilderness something to remind us of the captivity. To me. I was once a heroin, I was a speed freak, I was an alcoholic, I was a pothead, I was all of that above that goes with that. The lifestyle that goes along with that. I was all of that. He's given that testimony to me as the myrtle tree to remind me of what I used to be, to remind me of the cassia tree, that that's the wood that I want to be. That's the tree. The humanity of Christ is not that, but that's what's got to start coming out of me, is the life that Christ lived. I've got to live how he lived. <coughs> the oil tree. You know what they've done with the oil tree? They went up onto the roof and they built a little booth on the on the on the roof of their houses back in the house of Israel. The the, the people of Israel. They built a little booth and you know what they built that little booth out of? The oil tree. They built it out of that wood. The branches off the oil tree was the one. Where do we place the anointing? The anointing comes from above and flows down the beach. The anointing of God, the presence of God, the Spirit of God is being on my head and just flows all over me. The anointing that breaks the yoke. What am I yoked to? Whatever it is, it's that anointing whose house we are. Hebrews 3 6, I think, where Jesus is house. Talks about the house of Jesus, and Jesus says, In whose house? You are my, he talks about his house and he says in whom house who's, whose house you are that's me and you and on top of that house there's a little spot there that's made of the anointing of the oil the anointing oil when, they, when we get prayed we people put the anointing oil on your head it drips down you just don't see it, you don't feel it I've had it drip down sometimes and run into my eyes people are soaking that much with oil and it makes you blind and blurry but that's the kind of thing we've got to see every time. Even now that I've had it done 10 years ago, I still see that oil dripping down off of me. That's the anointing that's going to break the yoke. Anything that the Holy Spirit reveals to me that I'm connected to and I'm yoked to, it's that anointing running down the beard of Aaron that's going to break that yoke that I've got myself joined onto in the wilderness. In the wilderness. Because before I come into the wilderness... I didn't even want to know Christ. I wanted to know nothing about him. 
that I crossed the Red Sea and come up the bank into the wilderness, went through my water baptism, I'm in the wilderness now, waiting for the promised land. This is where God, he's taken care of the stuff in the water baptism, he's got rid of the demonic, the enemies and that, he's drowned them, he's buried them in the Red Sea. It's up to me now to go and live the life that Christ wants me to live so I can enter into that promised land. And he's given me all these things to help me along the way. He's given me the Holy Spirit. He's given me the blood of Christ. He's given me the humanity of Christ. He's given me the anointing above my head. And the myrtle tree, what did I, I think it was the myrtle, was oh, He's given me the testimony. He's given me the witness of the life I've come out of to the humanity, the witness of Christ. It's here. Just read about it. For the life that he wants me to live, I live for him. Amen. And I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the vine tree. Listen to this. A cypress tree represents the healing, uprightness, evergreen, He's putting that wilderness healing that we can receive healing, we can give out, we can have uprightness, we can be young again, we can feel young again, and he's placed in the wilderness everlasting life that we can have now. We don't have to wait till we promise cross over to the promised land. We can have eternal life now. We've just got to start walking in it. It's true. I didn't receive, I, I, the moment that God formed me in my mother's womb, or before that, we'll go back before that, he knew, he knew me and chose me in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4, he loved me and chose me in Christ Jesus. So before this world even existed, my mother wasn't even here, he loved me and chose me back then. He chose me back then. So right back then, I was chosen for eternal life. You were chosen for eternal life right back then. We all live for eternity. Some go into eternal death. And us, we live eternal life. We go into eternal life because we've got it right. We've used all the tools. When I started working where I'm working, like when you when you the labourer, you've got shovels, you've got rakes, you've got sledgehammers, you've got drills, you've got chisels, you've got all nails and hammers and jackhammers and whacker packers, you've got all these tools. And I became a, a, where I'm working now in the Salvation Army and that, and where I'm working now, you know what our tools are? The tools are our progress. Other things like we have three houses. A bad house, a good house. What would you picture your house to be like in the future? That's a tool. And I'm, I'm, it, it, it took me a long time to work out yeah, that well, they are tools. Instead of having a shifter or a pair of pliers or a hammer, we've got these tools that we go out and we present. And, and that's what we work with. So, in the wilderness, God has gave us all the tools that we have to be able to work a life to cross over into the promised land. And that tool is the Holy Spirit. That tool is Jesus Christ. That tool is the forgiveness we receive through his blood. That tool is the humanity of Christ that we need to learn to live and be like. That tool is the testimony of my old life that I'm going into this new life. Everlasting life. Being able to live for eternal life. And the cypress, the cypress tree, eternal life. Listen to this. They are long living trees. This is a cypress tree. He's given this to us as a tool in the wilderness. They are long living trees that are able to endure harsh climates and poor soil. I have given you a tool where you, Aunt Lil, are able to endure what you're going through right now. Mm -hmm. 
He's given you that tool to endure that. Every single one of us, whatever you are going through, he's given you the sight. I think it was a cypress tree. So as a tool that you can endure that. And it doesn't matter how hard and how dry it gets, that cypress tree grows in dry, arid places. He's given it to you for a tool to go into the hardest of places, the places where trees won't grow. He's given you a tool to be able to go in there and endure whatever comes up against you. That's what we've got in our wilderness. Hey? I'm hoping this is going to change your wilderness experience from this moment forward. You will know now when you're going through the wilderness, you're going through a place of being built for eternity. God's preparing me and shaping me to live with him for eternity. No more hardness, no more dryness, no more sickness. We've got it here. We don't have to wait to go home. It's here. Right here. They're our tools that he's given us. And the best thing about it you find it out today, you don't have to scratch your head for two or three years like me trying to work out what tools are they talking about that I work with. Hey? You find out today you have the tools in the wilderness to start working with. Hey? From this moment forward. I was sitting in the dead the cypress tree in the pine tree. The pine tree, you know what the pine tree represents in scripture? It represents peace. He's given us <coughs> something, the cypress tree, to endure hardship. And here's the pine tree, another tool said he's got peace. During that hardship, you've got peace. Hey? In, in Isaiah 60, 13, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. Hey? His divine tree is used to beautify the place of his sanctuary. That's the spiritual meaning of peace, to beautify with his sanctuary. Mate, this is where God dwells. He don't dwell out there. He dwells here. He's given me peace to beautify me. He's given you peace to beautify you. He's amazing. Here are the tools to walk through the wilderness. Here are the tools to cross into the promised land that I have for you. And the box tree together. So in the wilderness, he's given us the water. He's given us the cedar tree. He's given us the acacia tree, the myrtle tree, the oil tree the cypress tree, the pine tree, and now he's given us the box tree together. This box tree, I like the box tree. You know what the box tree is? The box tree has wood that is highly prized. You are the apple of my eye. The box tree's wood is highly prized. They wanted to build everything out of the box tree because it was a highly prized wood. It was worth something. You are the apple of my eye. Hey? It is used as an emblem of the abiding grace and prosperity of the church of God. So it is a highly prized by engraving. Not only just by, by people that engrave wood, the box tree is highly you are above the apple of his eye now. You are the ripest, shiniest apple of his fruit bowl of his eye right now because it's the prize of the engraver. Hallelujah. Hey? Thank you, and it, 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 it is an emblem, the box tree is an emblem of the abiding grace and prosperity for the church of God. So that's just planting box trees everywhere. When we get our, get our yard, if they get them in Australia, if we get our bills in our yard, the first tree we're going to plant to commemorate the opening of our service is a box tree. Because that's going to remind us we are the prized possession, the apple of his eye. We are abiding in the grace and the prosperity of God. 
Right? There's a, there's, there's a little bit to this, right? To beautify the temple. They used the boxwood to beautify the temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? If the box tree is used to beautify the temple, it's in the, it's in the wilderness to beautify God's people that he has given his peace to. Amazing, eh? Hey? To re- and this is, listen to this one. To remind the Hebrews of God's perpetual presence. To remind the people that God's Holy Spirit, his presence, his anointing, his son is in the wilderness with you. To remind us that we have them tools in the wilderness with us. Amen? So what's in the wilderness? We have the Holy Spirit, plenty of water, plenty of the Holy Ghost, given without measure. We have the seed tree, the king of trees, Jesus, the king of kings. The humanity of Christ, essential to his character. Hey, I, I wrote this down. John 1. I'll read it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to be a witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to be a witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. I am no longer slave to be. I am a child of God. <coughs> he gave us that right. That light came to bear witness that we are children of God. The humanity of Christ essential to his character. He was the came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name who were born not of blood nor of the will of flesh nor of the will of men but of God. Hey? That's the character. The character of the, the light to men, his character is people won't believe you. Not many He did not. He was not received by his own. So your own family won't even receive you. People won't believe you, but you are a child of God. That's his character. His character is he knew he was a child of God, and that's what we have to hold on to. He was a child of God. He is a child of God, and we need to know that we are children of God. The character of Christ that we need to bear is we need to know who our Father is. Right. When he taught them to pray, he said, Our Father, know who you pray to. Yeah. Know that you can ask your dad <coughs> in heaven, your Father, my Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Heaven is supreme over everything. Glorious, honourable, all holiness. I rejoice in you, Lord, and I give all glory to you, God. That's what we started with. Hallelujah. In, um, back at the beginning. Captivity of Israel. People who are free. The myrtle tree. They were the captivity. That's when it came about. So the myrtle tree symbolised what? People that become free. People that were in captivity. But they started talking about the myrtle tree because that's the era when people become free. The oil tree of the house covering with the anointing. Healing, uprightness, evergreen, eternal life. Cypress tree, long living, that are able to endure a harsh clients and poor soil. Peace, the pine tree. Christians 
who is made useful, profitable, and beautiful by the Lord. The box tree highly prized wood, God's grace and prosperity. That's what's in the wilderness. That's what's here now. This is where we are. Because we're wandering, we're not we're, we're roaming around and waiting for a little river to cross over. And when we go, so I'm not saying nothing, but the people wandered around in the wilderness for nothing. More or less, it was only a little it was only a little river they crossed. The Jordan River is no great big Red Sea or nothing that God had to part. It's only a little river. A little river. But they wandered around because they weren't ready to cross over. Hey? We're holding them up from coming. Who were born not of blood, not of the will of but nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Hey? Jesus was born because of God's plan in our life. That's the character. He had a plan through Jesus, and that's the character of us. The plan that he had in Jesus is the plan, the character that's got to come in our life. The, the amenity has got to come out in our life. I say this one all the time, but I'll read it. Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The humanity, the character of Christ. We were predestined before the foundation of this world. We were chosen for eternal life to be conformed into the image of Christ. Amazing. But we still have people who are not free and we have people who are free. We need, what do we need? We need the olive tree. Because that's the anointing. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. The only way, it's not going to come by me going up and saying anything to anyone. The only way is if I pray and pray, the Holy Spirit will come and then that will convict. This Romans 8, one, I don't know, did I use that last week? I don't know, use, I just, it's just come to me. You, you listen to this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus <coughs> who do not live according to the flesh. So what it's saying is, there are those who are in Christ Jesus who do walk according to the flesh. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh. There's condemnation for those who walk in the flesh. But those who do not walk according to, according to the flesh, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. That's the Holy Spirit quickened with our spirit, that we are children of God. That's the Holy Spirit coming when somebody's praying or something. The Holy Spirit, the, the, Jesus is in intercession to have someone to change. And me, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to change that. But if I walked up and I started talking to someone and told them to get their life in jack, you never get your life right, that's only going to get easy. And how many people are outside the church today because they got offended? Yeah. Hey? <clears throat> We've got to leave that part up to the Holy yeah. Spirit. He's the one that's going to change them, not us. As much as we want to see them change, we've got to leave it up to him. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I just thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, and thank you, Jesus. We have everything that we need right there with us that wilderness woman right now. Not there, right here. Because we are actually in the wilderness. We're going through that little cycle we're going through now to get all the rough edges off and he's given us the tools and, and the tools are trees. That, 
that represents him. Amen. He said, for the one thing, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the thing that's going to change him from the inside out. That's the only thing that's not a tree. Everything else is a tree, but the Holy Spirit is water in the wilderness. 